So let's immediately cut to the chase. Um, the first group, first question. Um, hi. Yes. Hi, I see. Yeah. Hi. We started discussing whether the question was formulated taking into assumption that there are optimal or ideal places to live. So we discussed that a bit and uh, our main message is most probably that it will be very different for different cities. You always have to take into account whether this specific city is livable or attractive and its natural resources, maybe infrastructure and geographical context around. So that was our first and main point that we probably always need to look into context. Also, we started um, thinking that, well, maybe there is an assumption in this question as well that uh, we need to continue developing the way we're doing now. And the question of consumption and maybe rethinking the whole concept of growth should be taken account into, into account. And also uh, end it with like... Oh, sorry, I see you had to cut you off, but uh, I just got a chat request that uh, we sort of um, formulate the question so that everybody is sort of oh, aware of what we're talking about. Well, I can quickly do it. Considering the vulnerability of cities and urban regions to natural catastrophes uh, due to their high organizational complexity, geographical position and dependence on important goods and services, I'm wondering whether cities really are the best places for increasing resilience and climate adaptation. Or should we instead be preparing for moving away from cities again as the climate crisis deepens? Yeah, we had kind of no one who was uh, stating that cities are the best places, but it might be for some specific cities that probably what our answer would be. And also that there are some issues of uh, our social norms around habits and attractiveness of living in the cities as it's established itself. As living in the city is more attractive than uh, the opposite. So if my group feels I'm missing something important, I guess we have a bit of time, no? We don't have to rush. Yeah, and may I add something to our group? Yeah, we, and we also, we talk about tipping points because we said that okay, a place should be livable and also sustainably livable. And, and, and okay, cities has been our great invention and it's been our creative destruction, but that creative destruction might turn out to be disruptive creation. It's going to, for example, uh, kill us. So there, there is a tipping point, whatever we are going to do, whatever pathway they're going to take, there's going to be a tipping point and we should know what that, when that tipping point is going to get close to us. For example, CO2, CO2 uh, uh, was, was a major component that made this planet livable, but nowadays that CO2 is going to kill all of us. So there is a tipping point to everything and we should consider that tipping point. Whether we should live in region area or city area, there is no optimal solution for a long time. So that's another intake that I could give. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, the, that I, I'm sus Expecting a bit of a sort of tension there also, right? Because on the one hand, you say, you know, we need to really um, contextualize. You know, that's very in line with sort of geographical thought that you know the categories of city and you know rural is just too blunt. And there's a, you know, there's such a variety in the way that cities are more or less prepared for climate change. Um, so, whereas I think a lot of the, the work on tipping points is classically sort of universalistic um, theory, right? It sort of provides a particular, um, a quite a definite sort of um, number or sort of, you know, configuration when things sort of go berserk. Um, so I think that, you know, tipping points probably can be very, again, um, different depending on, you know, what urban context um, you are considering. So that, that might be a bit, um, might be a bit difficult. 
I think uh, just to add one last thing, um, we've also discussed the question itself and its assumption that um, urban regions are more prone or more uh, uh, endangered by climate change. And I think that is also definitely a, a question of context. And there are some, some situations in which uh, uh, rural regions are compared to their cities, I guess, much more uh, risk prone and um, so yeah uh, there there would be also no no definite answer i guess if moving to the the rural regions or uh, expanding uh, climate uh, sustainability there would be much more sensible than in cities yeah. i guess you know uh, and in a sense as many observers have now argued in in in, in, in newspapers and and, and code co-ops um you know the current corona crisis is only sort of a uh, a prelude to the um pending climate crisis but already with the corona crisis we see that people are having you know quite radical thoughts about how this is going to shape the future of cities a lively debate about that um but um, it might also be that actually the way our, our categories of you know cities and um, rural and their interconnections um, is are, are going to change. And I think I would sort of be interested in really sort of how uh, this is going to change a relationship between uh, you know dense areas of urbanization versus sort of um, yeah sort of uh, the it's it's hinterlands i think also already in hinterlands maybe a, a metaphor that is is not really doing justice to um yeah what these places really stand for all right but thanks that was that was already really interesting and nicely connected to some of the points in the um, um uh, elements of, of of today's topics um then question two is regional sustainability transition likely to occur without instructions from the state I can get some more rolling here, I guess. Um, we spoke quite a while about the word instructions. Um, <laughs> for us, uh, this included a range of things, uh, incentives, rules, regulations, standards, even facilitating just a framework whereby different actors can communicate and interact with each other. The discussion, we more or less agreed that it's uh, not absolutely necessary. It's, we would, we felt uncomfortable saying that, I think. But uh, if the question is about likelihood, yeah, more often than not, the government, and that doesn't mean just the central government, but various levels of government need to be involved uh, in different ways. And so you can have uh, regional activities geared towards sustainability, whether it's related to sustainable fuels or sustainable building practices. But more often than not, you're going to have to engage the government, central government, or even local governments, uh, because that's where the power is, that's where the resources are, and they're just really good uh, coordinating mechanisms, so, especially with regards to the institutional framework. There are really no better uh, entities that we have that can do that. So mm. short question, relatively short answer, but uh, one nuance I think that uh, was brought up is that compared to other types of framing sustainability transition, if we're talking nationally or uh, focusing on a particular technology, regional sustainability transition perhaps has a greater emphasis on the coordination and the interaction between different levels mm. of government. And this gets into the classic uh, discussion about the movement from changing the discourse from government to governance. So that's more or less what we discussed. If anyone else in the group wants to chime in. Great. Thanks, Eric Joff.
Yeah, I think, I mean, um, especially thinking about regions and the literature on regionalism and stuff I was working with also in the past and regional innovations and very much acknowledges the multi-level governance of regions. And I mean, there's probably nothing that illustrates that better than the way that, you know, the European Union deals with regions and regional development. Um, and like, you know, the stuff I briefly uh, referenced, um, small specialization um, is not just about, you know, governing and government, but really some governance from a multi-stakeholder uh, perspective. And um, again, I think um, in, the thing is here, you know, what, what role um, do state um, actors and institutions play? Um, so indeed the question is a bit sort of, what do you mean really with instructions? And again, context is key. Um, in the regional development literature, there, you know, there's a there's a wide ranging typologies that differentiate between maybe more sort of de uh, sort of top down uh, governing of regions and regional development um, versus more you know um, bottom up um, approaches. So, um, but there's some, there's some interesting papers out there. Uh, Kevin Morgan uh, wrote about sort of, you know, what, what roles for, of state for uh, sustainable regional development. Uh, recent paper also by Susanna Boras and Jakob Edler, I think in research policy, was also about sort of identifying about 15 different roles and activities that um, state actors can play in uh, fostering um, or influencing and steering uh, sustainability transitions. So the state is probably, you know, it's probably a, a heritage of the, the neoliberal sort of way of looking at the world that you sort of want to make explicit where, you know, what the state should and should not do. Um, but I think if you look empirically at it, you know, the state is, implicated in many uh, sometimes very explicit and clear and sometimes in very nuanced ways right let's move to the third question um Kuhn et al 12 2012 concludes that translocal and transnational network relations and institutional interdependent needs need to be acknowledged by policymakers and transition managers even though they may extend beyond the sphere of influence to what extent, to what degree does it seem practical for policymakers to take such translocal and transnational phenomena into account when, for example, designing policies targeted at local and regional development? Is this a realistic expectation to have on policymakers? Um, yes, so <laughs> that's uh, an interesting question. That's your um, <laughs> in, in a way, um, <laughs> um, my my first reaction was that actually it's inevitable for policymakers to uh, take into account these relations. Um, we were discussing several elements of this. So these relations could be um, with the, it could be economic relations that makes uh, certain places uh, quite dependent upon uh, companies or processes that take place elsewhere, and it could be institutional interdependencies be that uh, connections between the local and the national level or things like the EU that influences uh, quite a bit uh, both giving opportunities and maybe some uh, limitations. Um, we were discussing how uh, an interesting thing here is directionality. Uh, because in some cases, uh, local policymakers might have, like in the case of transitions, they might have certain goals that are quite clear and then need to take into account uh, some things that they can't, cannot really influence, but that needs to, um, they need to adapt to it in some way in order to, to do this transition. In other cases, it might be that the directionality comes from outside. So in the case of the EU, for example, 
uh, the EU has some uh, quite ambitious environmental goals and that's an opportunity for places within the EU to obtain funds to do projects which they might partly use then for the goals of the EU and partly for their own goals so the directionality might be influenced then by these uh, relations. Um, we also discussed a bit the, the role of the researcher in this because sometimes it might be clear uh, that certain um, relations, non-local relations, uh, are obviously relevant. In other cases, uh, it might be useful to have um, an analysis uh, to identify factors that need to be taken into consideration. Um, and yeah, there are also power relations in this. So it says explicitly, uh, even though they may extend beyond the sphere of influence, right? So I think the examples of Airbnb is a very good example. A lot of cities are changing their regulations to uh, kind of avoid some of the negative impacts uh, of Airbnb. Uh, but this far, um, city governments have to a small extent been able to influence the way Airbnb operates their platform. Um, yeah, so there are some power dynamics in this as well. Um, does someone from the group have something to add? No? <laughs> Maybe the person that uh, came up with this question could respond um, if you like. Let's see if he is in the room. Nope. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm here. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Hi, Matthew. Um, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I guess. I guess what I was thinking was not so much the translocal, but the transnational phenomena where it's difficult for, say, local policymakers to take transnational phenomena into account. So I was thinking more of like a kind of maybe this is a bit too much of an epistemological burden, something like that. So mm -hmm. I could have formulated the question better, but I. Yeah, if there's going to be any further discussion, just to refocus it in, in that direction, because that's kind of that's mostly what I was thinking. But um, I mean, it, it particularly I think resonates with um, some of the stuff that 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 Hovart is is very familiar with and talked about yesterday. Um, you know, the notion of policy mobility, and um, which which explicitly is about you know how local policy making is influenced by uh, sort of best practices and um, yeah, mobile policy prescriptions from from elsewhere, and <clears throat> you could again say, and, and that critic that literature is actually quite quite critical of sort of uh, copycatting uh, policies, and um, I mean for for good reasons. I you know alluded in my own presentation about the Silicon Valley syndrome and how you at some point in time saw silicon clusters popping up everywhere in the world. Um, at the same time, you could say, well, but you know, there's, there, there is also something progressive and emancipatory um, to the fact that you know, policy makers um, can get inspiration and ideas um, and empowerment um, beyond their sort of immediate, um, yeah, uh, territory or within their country um, but there's obviously there, there are trade-offs in the extent to which there is sort of policy learning uh, perhaps between you know distant places um, that you know the you, it's, it is impossible to get the full sort of understanding um, of how a policy came about what effects it created and so on um, yeah, and, and, and that could be sort of creating a bit of a, uh, an information overdose or overkill for, for policymakers and partly could explain, for example, that a lot of the, say, knowledge circulation in those big city networks like 100 resilient cities or C40, you know, 
on the surface tends to be quite superficial um, and sort of, you know, doing a lot of the, the usual sort of blah, blah. But over time, they do allow also for maybe more intimate uh, communities of practice to evolve also between practitioners and policymakers that provide for more sort of deeper, um, um, more substantial sort of uh, learning uh, relationships. All right, excellent. Um, I think we'll move on to our fourth question. Um, how can regional urban transition processes be studied adequately knowing that these territorial containers are often unformalized and highly interdependent of one another? Yeah, thanks Lars for repeating the question. Um, we had a shared understanding at the beginning that it's indeed uh, regions and urban areas are unformalized. So, um, and that's, that's uh, lead us to the uh, question about yesterday, like the, the GIS, the global innovation system, like there's strategic coupling and ties between regions and, and urban areas. So, um, Niels made the point of like, maybe you can um, study it with a relational approach. So it's a quite common um, approach and especially in economic ge geography to, yeah, like, this, the ties between the regions and and yeah which actors are involved and you can you can map it um so the the study could be like a social network an analysis um mm. but then we concluded that there's more than pure geography so um, cities are distinct from one another like that let's say regarding their personality values and norms differ so um yeah we have different lenses how we can look at cities and, and regions and we need to take them into account and also like policies vary uh, between between the cities and globally of course so we said um, yeah do we, do we have a common vision uh, what is, is uh, sustainability so maybe it uh, varies also across the globe and how uh, cities and regions want to achieve this goal of sustainability so um, we said maybe in the beginning you have to define your study of object and, and which context you are in and then maybe you can yeah answer this question of sustainability transition um in, uh, in relation to your city mm. maybe it's in europe or southeast asia or everywhere else so yeah, yeah because of this uh, interdependencies you can only uh, always only cover a small piece of the cake and you can't explain the whole uh, transitions. Yeah, that's the the, the everlasting uh, um, conundrum of uh, doing research on transitions. It's, yeah, <laughs> um, great. Um, very nice food for thought. Any responses? I think there is an interpretive flexibility or about relational. Um, I think there is, it could be an interesting um, differences perhaps between the, our two schools here where you could, you know, there's, there's a lot of work, you know, where the networks and the relationships are um, being mapped out through social network analysis, um, taking a bit more of an, an extensive approach. Um, and, and then you have also uh, relational sort of turn and relational thinking. Uh, which has of a more sort of qualitative nature and sort of drawing on work like actor network theory um, and I've, I'm, I've been always a bit fascinated how you know these are both sort of relation emphasizing you know the relational but um, methodologic methodologically um, you know very very different worlds and the thing you I like what I thought about at the end when you mentioned the interdependencies um, got me to think about um, one of the keynotes at the NEST conference um, the other day by uh, Giuseppe Fiola, which, uh, which, like many, sort of also sort of problematized well, the sustainability of sustainability transitions. And I think what a, a really important point he made was that um, sustainable development is a global project and um, it, there are inherently global uh, interdependencies. So, so far, I think we often sort of looked at sort of the, the positive and the productive sort of elements of 
um, you know, relationships and networks beyond a locality. But we have far less sort of looked at how there can also be negative interdependencies and think about sort of the, the consequences of how, you know, um, electric vehicles uh, create increased demand for uh, rare, rare metals in, say, South America um, that need to be also brought to Norway in a very sort of cheap, in the cheapest way possible, and thereby sort of creating um, irresponsible forms of, of, of mining in other regions. So I think those negative inter interdependencies, and which have something to say also about sustainable development, become increasingly also um, a, a matter of concern. All right, um, question five, then. In what terms does an interdisciplinary approach of traditional sustainability transition research with a spatial geographical dimension influence the generalizability of the findings? And how much does generalizability matter in sustainability transitions research? Yeah, hello. Um, so first of all, we kind of discussed that um, sort of the interdisciplinary nature and um, spatial geographical nature is important because you need to kind of capture these spatial aspects between regions and it, it might be uh, different transitional dynamics in a developing country or a, or a developed country, for example. And also since transitions are these kind of complex processes, it's quite important to understand many different aspects of it. So you kind of require this interdisciplinarity. But of course, <laughs> since you have to adjust to, to spatial and regional differences and you have to sort of try to take in, uh, into account all these different uh, interdisciplinary uh, aspects and considerations, it, it could definitely influence uh, the general, generalizability of, of, uh, of your findings and, and what you're studying. Um, so uh, it might certainly add, add some challenges there. Uh, but depending sort of on what you're studying or your research question and what you want, it, it's not really black and white whether how much it matters. Uh, in some studies, it might be very important to kind of build up generalizable theoretical uh, stuff so you can use it and apply it in, when you're studying other transitions. In others, you might want to focus more on sort of direct policy implications for the region or the specific transition uh, you're studying. So sort of the, the overall, uh, I think the overall uh, sort of conclusion of the group was like neither of the questions are black and white. Like, yes, it might certainly influence the general accessibility. Uh, there are some real challenges there and I, and I think it's quite important to, to be critical about those as a, as a researcher and to, to reflect on them. Uh, and how much this matters uh, depends a little bit on, on study to study. And it can kind of, you can probably also do some stuff to try to draw generalizable um, um, insights even from less generalizable uh, studies, but you have, you have to reflect on them. Mm -hmm. And if my group feel, feel like I forgot something, go ahead. Um, I might add to that, that I think uh, Jorgen, put it well together what we discussed but just to make things clearer on the fact that there are many different levels in this as well we can go about thinking regional national or, or, or global and that will bring certain implications with it also for generalizing and how how you are able to bring to bring a framework or an idea from one context to another because even if they at first glance maybe seem it seems that they don't, don't have that much in common. You will always find points that you can use. And also, of course, to what extent a certain um, framework will be useful depends on what you're trying to do with it. Are you trying to, to understand something that has happened in the, in the past? Or are you trying, as a policymaker, for instance, to make change? And without having those, those answered from before, like what has already been found out and what is generalizable it's it, of course you never know what what you will end up with in the in the in the future any, anyways but it also it at least gives you some kind of idea of what might happen mm -hmm. um, and I think we didn't discuss that uh, this in the group but I think this question also relates quite well to question three where we where we discussed that it's inevitable for, 
for policymakers to to not take these aspects into account. So yeah. Great. Um, very thoughtful. Um, any other responses? You know, this is an, interest, uh, an interesting also from a sort of science policy interface. And it, it strikes me also how uh, certain, say, epistemological traditions um, uh, enjoy greater um, value or validity among policymakers, even though, yeah, um, that's not necessarily because of the actual insight that they give to be very concrete. Um, for example, when talking to policymakers in regional development, they often want to, you know, find out or hear about sort of, you know, uh, quite kind of linear causal explanations for what drives regional development. And they like to sort of see, you know, what did large scale studies on, you know, Europe's all regions sort of find in terms of what are the determinants of innovation. And then they sort of uh, say that, that those sort of main, you know, causal explanations uh, should inform their policy in their region. And, and that sort of strikes me as kind of a, something kind of doesn't really make sense there uh, in the way that scientific knowledge is being translated to inform uh, policy making and how sort of generalizable knowledge is then sort of um, in a way sort of uh, falsely translated into actionable uh, knowledge. At the same time, um, just kind of coming with, I've got this wonderful case study and it is so insightful uh, and a policymaker won't listen to you and be like, yeah, yeah, but that was, you know, that was in the rural area in Germany. How, what can I learn from that here in, in Australia? So um, again, that's, that, that, that can be a bit of a challenge at times. Um, we're nearly at the end of today. Um, yes, I just wanted to <laughs> add uh, uh, something that I've seen this question and I've seen actually all the questions that we've been discussing and even before. It's a general uh, critique that I maybe would have to this focus on uh, cities. It is that, for example, in question um, four, we talk about territorial containers and we use several um, ideas referring to cities as just one unit in general. Mm. And uh, with my experience on the innovation studies, I would say that in many cases, seeing uh, cities as a unit would be misleading, especially if you come from the South um, developing world, mm. where in many cities you have actually many sub cities. People don't really know what happened other just in another neighborhood. Right? Yeah. So having a city as a, as a concept where you make the analysis may actually just not help you understand how the innovation is happening. Because some neighborhoods may have direct contact with people on the other side of the world, yeah. more than what they're having with the neighborhood. Yeah. That's, uh, no, no, very good point. Thanks, thanks Joaquin. And I, I think that is partly, you know, why people take a more relational approach to, to space than uh, when, when, when making sense of, you know, the, the dynamics and the intricacies of, 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 of a city, um, rather than sort of, you know, treating it as a sort of reified, uh, yeah, container. Good point. Thanks. Final question here. Uh, six, the readings for the model emphasize the need for an analysis of the trajectories and directionality of transition in specific regions, <clears throat> but do not address how such trajectories or directions can be anticipated. The exercise of anticipating risks and opportunities should be, in my view, an essential element for defining and understanding any transition in a region. How can anticipation be included within the discussed theoretical frameworks? Um, okay. Um here yeah, I'll be I'll be addressing the question so um, I think first uh, the first thing that I sh should start with is try to unpack that question and identify what anticipation actually is because this was part of the discussion that we had uh, so if we view anticipation as some form of prediction of the future from that point forward we can sort of reflect back on what transition uh, theories look into it so uh, transition theories try to identify changes uh, that may lead to future uh, 
uh, some form of future trajectories that we can try to, um, in some form, predict. Um, but then at the same point, um, simply identifying that the future is predictable and that you can specifically identify what will happen in, in, in the near future or the far future is much more complex than, uh, than, than, than this. So uh, since the question is more lean towards like um, um, placing anticipation within a theoretical framework, what I will be trying to do is to reflect back on my work where I work with actually with complexity theory and which looks into prediction uh, quite closely and try to link that to, to transitions. So from a complexity perspective, ontologically it views reality as um, an interconnected set of systems that is very complex and uh, in some sen sense unpredictable. So uh, in some sense, it doesn't allow you to predict the future. It more allows you to look into different scenarios in some sense, uh, which is what becomes interesting uh, because uh, since complexity looks into futures as some form of change and urban transition in itself is some form of change as well. There's some form of link there. So by linking those two, we can try to sort of reflect back that anticipation in itself cannot be really viewed as some form of prediction of the future. It's more of scenario based up as a scenario based approach where we try to identify um, the potential different scenarios and the risks and opportunities there. Uh, and based on that, we can then uh, try to shift out our current policies or current activities or whatever it is that we are, what we're actually researching uh, and actually apply this kind of urban trans sustainable transition that we're looking forward to. And to give a simple example, for instance, 50 years ago, um, if, we, if we would be trying to predict the future 50 years ago, we couldn't really anticipate, for instance, the presence of uh, electric cars, uh, for instance. So anticipating the transportation urban transition in some sense wouldn't really be possible. And the complexity series that does really like uh, empower that because it really identifies future as unpredictable and path dependent in some sense. So if, if the group feels like I've, uh, I've missed up on something, they can, I mean, add. Thank you. I think that was, was again, an, an excellent, an excellent reply. Um, and nice to hear it sort of resonates a bit with your, with your own PhD. Um, just out of interest uh, that some of the proponents in transition research come from also a sort of a modeling uh, scenario background. Um, and yeah, in that sense, also early work on, uh, because I mean, anticipation and scenarios is, has, has been always quite a big thing also in, 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 in you know, governing transitions and in transition management, for example. Um, and it sort of, it emphasizes a lot uh, how this envisioning and then backcasting is supposed to sort of provide agency to, um, yeah, to shift paths. But at the same time, I think what is maybe less well known from this literature is that it very much sort of worked often with multiple scenarios to sort of, think through consequences of particular decisions or structures or and so on and so on. Um, so I think again the sort of the caricature of transition management would have sort of set that approach away as just sort of dreaming about uh, the future whereas I think um, a lot of these exercises are actually informed by modeling. Also the, <clears throat> uh, the resilient Melbourne strategy um, was you know a a result both of um, modeling trends uh, about you know where things were going with the city and I don't think that by 2050 uh, Melbourne will be uh, 50 million people even though that's what the sort of predictions say but that that is just sort of a way, as a way to sort of you know think through what consequences would be um, but that is often kind of um, combined with messy stakeholder consultation and co-creation workshops to sort of um, not extrapolate, but rather sort of um, create, you know, alternative imaginaries. All right, um, we're again a little bit into overtime, so let's start wrapping this up. Uh, thanks so much for um, your active uh, engagement and uh, contribution in, 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 this, in the module and the session. Um, 
I don't know if there is any sort of final reflections on on the past three hours. If not, I it's always a bit sort of a black box what is happening in the in the breakout rooms. But I, I hope you've also had some uh, use uh, of you know being part of you know mingling with with another um, PhD course. Which is obviously now entirely possible in in the age of uh, of Zoom. I think that's a, that's a that's a nice thing. Um, yeah. Then uh, I wish the participants in the Bergen Research Summer School a very enjoyable and stimulating remainder of their summer school.